Hi. Okay, I think that I got it. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> okay. That, your, your headset looks so fancy. I know, it, it allows me to talk to you without having your audio out in the room. Oh. So that we can just, like, so that everybody else doesn't hear our conversation. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's very handy for me, yeah. <laughs> I got this microphone um, here, but I don't know if it is going into the, does it just sound like a, oh, wait, one more person. Hi. This is all new. <laughs> I haven't done this before. Is this your is this your first Zoom book club? Yes. Nice. Well, we'll see how it goes. I'm happy happy to be the inaugural guest. Thank you so much. Let's see. Maybe just give a few more minutes. Hi, Terry. Good afternoon or good whatever good morning, whatever time it is out in Hawaii, okay. wherever you are. It's eight in the morning here. Yeah. Well, it's two in the afternoon in Michigan. Michigan. Yep. And you're in Toronto, right, Jennifer? That's right. It's the same time for me. Hi, Terry. Hi, Jennifer. Wow, well, you have a lot of books there. Yes. <clears throat> it's what happened when, happens when you get married and both of you have libraries to combine. <laughs> Let's see. Should um and we're not confined to um to 40 minutes um jennifer i thought that um that we might that, that we would just go with the free version which ends at 40 minutes but i went ahead and paid for it so oh, okay sure yeah okay. great i like your haircut too oh thank you, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I usually let it go for far too long and then I have to get it cut short and then it grows again and then short and then it's the same style all the time, but just different part of the spectrum. <laughs> now, Mariah, can you, can you hear me okay? Like, can you? Yes, I have this connected to my hearing aids directly, so. Okay. Yeah, and you, you articulate really well, so thank you. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, also, I wanted to let you know this is being recorded, and then after it is done recorded, re being recorded, and it's on the Zoom um, cloud, it will be transcribed. Perfect. And, and yeah, and so that way I can put it on the website and include the, the link so other people can enjoy this interview. Great. After. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I, I imagine it's hard to, to get people to come live to these things that yeah. they may be just planning to watch it later. That's, yeah. Can yeah. we get started then? Because I have a lot I want to talk about with you. Sure, absolutely. Okay, okay great. Um, so, so, so many of these questions are based on the, um, the written interview that we had a few years ago. Um, and the first, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, No Ordinary Boy and um, about why you felt the need to write his story. Oh boy. Okay. So no, no, I call no ordinary boy, a, um, an account. People like to call it a memoir. And I, I struggle a little bit with that, with that term, mostly because, you know, funny enough, uh, people often comment on how intimate it it was like the book is and how personal it, they felt it was but I actually felt like I was writing it from a very dispassionate place and from a place where um, I wasn't infusing I, I wasn't reflecting a lot of my emotional state at the time I that that was my own feeling about it and so uh, I, I often think of it as more of an account of our experiences so I'm describing certain discrete events and I'm uh, you know, walking the reader through some of our experiences. Um, and I mean, of course, that falls under the definition of memoir, but <laughs> I don't, I don't think of it that way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a, an artful book, in a way, now that I look back on it, because what I had been trying, you know, I, I wasn't doing it ironically at all, when I had taken some of those 
excerpts and put them at the beginning of chapters for each of the medical reports and some of the specialists. That, that's the beginning of every chapter. There's a little um, quote from some of our actual literature that we got from the physicians. One of the things I noticed at the end, like or many years later even, was that as as each chapter unfolds, each of those accounts gets more and more ludicrous <laughs> and more and more divorced from our actual experience. So there would be all this kind of fantasy about what Owen's learning in school or, you know, about the hopes for the future or, you know, things like that. And I just became more and more clear that this was all fiction in a way. And so at the very beginning, it starts out as quite literal and accurate. And then I feel this divergence between our experiences and what I'm describing versus the, the medical excerpts and what the medical people were seeing and, and experiencing. So anyway, that's, uh, I sort of di diverted there, but um, the book itself feels like a, a, a time capsule of um, discrete experiences that kind of build along the way. And it, and it really was designed, or it was meant to help the reader grasp little bits of insight into what a private life looks like for a family like ours. Um, and you had a second question. Oh, why did I write it? Why did I? Yeah, so what made me want to write it? So the, the honest truth is that um, throughout Owen's life, I had been speaking a lot. I had been invited, a, gu a guest speaker in different environments, and I had been um, you know, speaking to medical students and new physiotherapists and, you know, it was part of what I did was just tell our story to a number of groups and audiences. And I, I found it really, over time, I found it quite draining. And I found that uh, it was becoming more and more of a performance mm -hmm. so that I would get up and I would, you know, tell these you know, wonderful and terrible stories and the audience would respond and some of it I just didn't connect to anymore. I wasn't feeling like I wanted to dwell in it, but I had to wait for the audience to catch up. And so that became, um, you know, I, I thought to myself, why don't I just write some of these things down and see where it goes. And, and I had started putting things out on my blog and I thought, you know what, I, I don't need to stitch this together to be a perfect story. I can just put out these essays and combine them into a, a kind of an arc, you know, because it, it um, I, I didn't start writing it until after Owen died. So I had a, a beginning and an end, if you will. Um, and I had an editor um, and my editor was very much an advocate for the reader. So he would say things like, well, it's, it's confusing that you went from this to this. Maybe you should think about explaining something in the middle here or, um, you know, in particular, my my relationship with Owen's dad, uh, you know, Michael was kind of present at some spots and then suddenly he disappeared and then my new partner was at the end. And I remember my, yeah, my, my editor said, you know, <laughs> I mean, I realize it's not really about your relationship, but this is super confusing. And people will want to know. I mean, it's, and, and I can see that in hindsight that people really, you know, as, as far as it being an accessible story for people beyond our community, um, it's the relationships that people really relate to and connect to and, you know, the breakdown of a marriage and all of that kind of stuff. So um, there were parts of the story that I added simply for continuity. And it's not that I made it up, but it was, these were things that I was a mildly reluctant to put in the book, but felt like, you know, it's, it's, it's the, I need to do it for the sake of the reader. Um, so I put the book together just to back up a second so that I could honestly stop telling the story in real time. Yeah. I, I, you know, from, for a, about five years after I wrote the book, if people wanted me to come talk, especially to a small audience, I would say, absolutely tell everybody to read the book <laughs> and yeah. then I'll, and then I'll come, you know, we can pick up from there because I don't want to like be, showing all the slides and my family story and going through it all again. Yeah. And it, and it honestly wasn't even because I felt uh, like it was too emotional for me. It was in fact the opposite. I, I wasn't doing it justice and I, I felt a little bit bored and irritated yeah. <laughs> and that's not a good place, you know, to be telling, telling the story. Um, and I, I hear this all the time. I mean, I, I mean, you know, Mariah, like, you know, the, the, the amount of times you have to, 
repeat the story, tell the story, you meet new people. Um, you know, you can, you can, one can choose not to recount the story all the time, but then I would meet people who had all sorts of wrong impressions or would make assumptions. So I would need to then delve into things. And so I just felt like capturing it in one spot would be uh, very helpful for me um, as a kind of, um, you know, piece of literature that would follow me around. And I, I didn't really think about it as a product or as something to sell or even something to distribute. Um, my, first, my first task after I published it was, you know, I made a website because that's what I do. And I, I did all sorts of, you know, I got a PayPal account and did those things. But then I just called up libraries. I said, would you like a copy of the book? I, I mailed it out to all my friends. So, you know, I, I did a book launch here in Toronto that I organized and it was lovely. You know, many people came and I, and I sold the whole box <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm done now. I, I did a good thing. And now, now that part's done. So it, it didn't, I never, never, ever thought of it as a commercial product. It was um, try, just trying to put a stake in the ground, you know, just put a little border around it and, uh, and just say, okay, here it is. Here's this little box of my memories and, uh, people can can read it if they want to talk further with me about it. So you, you just got more than you asked for, but uh, that's... Oh, I love it, love it. Um, yeah. there's, there's one of the things that, that really struck me in the book, um, which is one of the reasons why I loved it so much, was your, um, was your neutral tone. You know, I really mm. loved that. Like I felt, you, you had said that, that er, I mean, earlier you were talking about people saying that it was very passionate or emotional or something and that kind of struck me because I was like wow that was that was one of the reasons why 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 I, I felt so connected to it is that I felt like you were just telling the story mm -hmm. it weren't I didn't get the feeling at all that you were infusing um, a lot of emotion or anything and it was just sort of like you were neutrally relaying recounting the events as they happened and and that was the question that I had for you was was that deliberate or was that like were you deliberately like being neutral about it or or am I wrong in thinking that you were neutral about it yeah no so I, I'll just I, I'm not sure if I misspoke before but I think what I meant to say was that people thought of the book as very like in like they were intimately um exposed to my thoughts and my and perhaps my feelings that you know I would recount some of my emotional responses not that I was emotional in the book like in writing it but um, people felt like they had insight into a place that was very um, they, they appreciated what they thought of as my willingness to be transparent and intimate and revealing um, and I felt like that because of that measured tone that I wasn't at all, I thought, oh, I'm just telling the, the facts of the case and, and that's it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And but to to answer your question, I mean, it's sort of how I am in everyday life. I, I used to have a friend that um, that called me Spock. <laughs> uh, so I do have I do have a very, um, you know, my capacity for chaos and turmoil and upset is very high and in fact I get calmer in the face of turmoil you know it's very rare to see me ratchet up into something very uh reactive yes um and so with Owen's life and in recounting it 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 was always pretty uh I felt like um there were a lot of a lot of parts to manage Mm -hmm. A lot of decisions to make, um, a lot that was outside of my control, mm -hmm. and I did not dwell on that at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, at, I mean, a little bit. I, I shouldn't say at all. I mean, of course I did, but I, um, most of what you're seeing in the book and what you would have seen in real life, too, is me managing, managing stuff all day, every day, um, you know, like a processing plant <laughs> or something. Um, so it wasn't deliberate that I took out emotional stuff. I just never thought to put it in. And a lot of it, um, I, I also felt like, you know, there were things that as a, as humans, you know, we all experience. And I, I assumed that people would fill in some of the gaps, you know, this was hard work and it was emotional and there was a lot of grief at the beginning and a lot of coming to terms and grappling with my own 
responsibilities and you know this isn't what I signed up for this isn't what I I wanted you know the, this is all it all came at me very fast and I but I thought I don't that's not a part of it's not what I want to write about yeah. I think people will assume that and I it's also not what I want to talk about it's not I mean not here is fine but yeah. it wasn't what I wanted to make his life about or my own experience with him um, so yeah, it was a, it was an editorial choice as I was writing about not to leave those things out, but what is it I want to focus on mm. and what are the pieces that people just never see or understand? Um, so that, that's maybe where that line sort of, uh, wh where you're sensing mm -hmm. that whether it was emotional or not. Mm. Well, I know that, that, um, that with within the down syndrome community with other moms that i talked with about this book i mean privately they one of the things that they really loved about it was the fact that you called um you called bs <laughs> like mm -hmm. like with with all of the 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 pieces about the reports from the school or about that you know he's showing leadership and you're like well how can he be doing that and 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 just you're you're asking questions and 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 really isolating things that didn't make sense and 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 talking about that was that one of those pieces that you you just now you said that you identified the pieces that people weren't really talking about and and you wanted to respond to that, Is that yeah in there I'm yeah sorry. absolutely my hearing aid it was it oh. just, okay um, it wasn't a conscious choice in terms of a topic like, oh, I need to reveal this side of things. Yeah. Um, but I did find that the stories that were the most interesting for me to talk about and write about were the ones where there was so much absurdity and disconnect to reality. Um, I found them kind of funny, a lot of those stories, you uh -huh. know, and, and absurd. And um, I gravitated to those as what I wanted to write about. And I think in hindsight, I look back and I, I kind of marvel at the book <laughs> and, and, you know, I don't want to say my writing, but the, the stories themselves, they really are ridiculous. And at the same time, so ordinary for what we, you know, our everyday lives were just nonstop absurdity yeah. um, and pretending and, um, you know, people needing to feel optimistic and positive and cheerful. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I felt like I had to leave, um, give a lot of space to other people's need for positivity. Yeah. <laughs> so that some of the things that you read about in like these stories that I told, they were mostly in my head. And I didn't necessarily confront therapists or or say something in the moment, I would just be like, what? This is weird. Okay, I guess, you know, well, we'll do this thing. And then, you know, part, part of it was calculated because I knew we had to do certain things in order to get funding or for reports to be written or for, you know, the young physio to fill out her job sheets, you know, it's like, so you learn, you learn the system, you learn what has to be done, and you just suspend your disbelief a lot of the time. Yeah. But some of it was very conscious in my mind, like, this is the dumbest thing we'll ever do. <laughs> and then other things were, you know, I would be in like, therapy mom mode, where I would be at home and go, this is all garbage. And then I would come to the therapy session and be like, okay, we're gonna learn how to walk today. And I would, you know, sort of get behind it. So it it was a it's 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 complicated. <laughs> yeah, it is. What what was your favorite part in the book? Oh, such a good question. I, I think it's some of these very small moments. So when I, people sometimes ask me when I give a talk um, to read, to pick a part to read out loud. Mm -hmm. And so I'll hand pick a couple of stories um, and I always gravitate to the same ones. And they're the ones where the moments are very small. Like it's just this snapshot of a moment in time where like there's one particular story 
where I think it was Angus's birthday or it was Owen's birthday and I had rigged up the hairdryer to blow out the candle and everybody's singing happy birthday and Angus and his friends are getting irritated and they just start digging into the cake and the whole thing is is a disaster in a way and Ang or Owen rather um, just got nothing out of it except for you know some moments of connection with him and I or you know and it just really revealed how tragic and absurd and funny and kind of pathetic and you know all these all these efforts like I can just see my young self in my mind doing all these things and I just think oh my god I'm I'm so sorry <laughs> that all of that you know that but there's no go you know there's no way to there's no way to un um it, it gosh like it, of course you can't undo it but there's there's no way to think of it differently like these are paths that all parents take and I, I it's just you know it's just looking back on your younger self and going oh if only you knew that you know now what you knew then or vice versa so anyway it's it's I, I think that's definitely one of my key key stories in the book yeah. um and then there was, I would have to remember uh, specifically which ones, but there were also a couple of moments that I recounted where there's a real revelation that comes. Um, one of them around the deep brain stimulation. I think it was uh, one of the surgeries we were considering where I have this like, wait a minute. And it, and it, was, an, it was an instant where I was like, that, that just doesn't make any sense. And, and it was the same with the deafness and the cochlear implant and um, so I think my favorite, yeah, my favorite parts of the book are these, you know, where I really sat with my own, um, you know, my own eagerness to fix and my own striving as a parent, and then, and then appreciating and realizing that, uh, you know, there's room to change your mind. <laughs> and, and that, you know, it's good to question what authorities are saying or people in who have, you know, who you see as expert um, to question what they're saying and, and that you can decide something different. And so that those, those were key pieces of the book for me. Those, those really, um, I feel like are the, uh, the real teaching moments or something, I don't know, in the book and, and the point of the book. Yeah. I know that you're questioning in the deaf um, piece of it, it meant a lot, you know, to deaf readers. They really appreciated that. That's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just poking in it and, and, and asking the, 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 the questions that you did, you know, and then um, learning to sign. I mean, that was incredible. It was, they answered a, so many um and what like what the deaf community are asking you know hearing parents to do with deaf kids well and you know the other um what was interesting to me was um hearing from families afterwards many of which uh you know the majority of of families that i meet who have deaf children do have cochlear implants mm -hmm. and so reading this book um i would say about half of them well Typically, people who I only hear from people who connect with the book, people who reacted perhaps more, uh, who had strong reactions to the book, where they thought, you know, they they felt attacked personally, or where they felt like, well, I don't, you know, is she criticizing me and my decisions? You know, I I don't hear from those people. I mean, that's just how how it all works. So the people I hear from um, are self-selected to be, you know, connecting to what I say, but I have certainly heard from an, a, a good amount of hearing parents of deaf children who decided to get cochlear implants, who deeply regretted it, or who said, you know, it was, we felt it was worth a try, but it's just, it was not a good decision. Yeah. Um, and so they're not fully regretting the, tr the try, you know, they felt that that's what they had to do, um, but they acknowledge that uh, it was not the promise that it that it put out from the beginning yes and it's so but I, I mean i really understand it seeing it you know from where i stand how much pressure parents have to do that like there's just tremendous pressure to 
to have the surgery or to, I mean, slapping on hearing aids isn't, you know, anywhere near as invasive as the cochlear implants, but, but there's just so much pressure on parents to do that. It's, yeah. Well, and I would, I would say that the worst part of it is that it's not even really, in many cases, it doesn't feel like pressure. Mm. It is simply mm. the right thing to do. Right. Like, don't, don't you want your child to hear? It's like, well, yes. Well, we have a solution for you. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's, you know, it doesn't, it feels like um, a hope, a hopeful future. And so I, I, I mean, it's possible that people feel very conflicted and then they feel pressure and then it becomes this boiling point and then they say, okay, yes, we'll do it. You know, I, but I don't hear a lot of that. It's usually, well, of course, we want to do everything we can and why would we not? So it, it doesn't feel like pressure, I think, it, but you're, it, it's fine to call it pressure because it's still a, you know, the industry is coming down, you know, it's, it's channeling parents and families through a certain path. Um, and that is certainly a pressure that pushes people forward. But I'm not sure that it always feels like uh, direct pressure mm -hmm. to, to well, do the surgery. Point, no, it's, it's just like what you said. It's, it's not, it doesn't always feel like pressure. It's just the obvious path. Like, right. It yes. It's structural. Yes. It's structural. Yeah. Such a good point. And it's, it, I mean, even in the Down syndrome community for how it was when I was pregnant with Moxie with the, with the termination and you would face something similar with Owen, mm -hmm. it, of course you're going to terminate, you know, like, you know, your child's going to be born with a disability. So why would you want to have? A yeah. Child? Yes. Yep. Wow. That's, that's what, um, so I had I have this list of questions, so <laughs> looking through them. And yeah. Terry, please, please feel free to chime in too. I didn't, I, you know, I, I don't know if you have questions for for Jennifer. Okay, but, thanks. Yeah, but the I I wanted to ask you what was the most challenging aspect of telling your story, Jennifer? What was the most the the, the hardest part about writing the book, or yeah, about writing the book? I was acutely aware of, like, I, I didn't, I didn't worry too much about Owen's privacy. So uh, for any, for any number of reasons, I wasn't worried about revealing Owen's life to people and that somehow that was ethically problematic. I mean, but I, of course, would never have written a book about Angus's childhood, my other son. Um, or I would never have written a book about someone else in my life with this much intimate detail. So it was an interesting thing, but I mean, just, it's a, it's a simple fact. I wasn't too, mo too worried about revealing Owen's life to people, but I was very concerned about um, Angus, Michael, like the people in our lives. Um, so one of the hardest parts for me was uh, keeping focused on my experience and uh, the things that I knew happened. So not, not imagining Owen's life with his caregivers or, or trying to um, portray, you know, when he would go to Michael's on the weekend or, you know, I, I tried very, I, I had to work very hard to stay focused on what I felt was my own truth about what I experienced. And that's partly maybe why it sounds at times a little bit, not necessarily clinical, but a, a little more detached, right? Because I was worried about not making assumptions about how other people felt. Um, and I did send, you know, and, and also too, that's why Michael was not in the book at all. It's, it's almost as though I was a single parent the entire time. And so I actually had to strategically try to put him back in. <laughs> and I needed to write that piece in the middle. There's about three pages of you know, it feels like a bit of a, like a, like a break in the book in a way where I describe my relation, like, I'm like, okay, guys, here's, here's the thing with Michael and why, you know, we did split up in this time. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I had to, I had to surgically insert him <laughs> so that it, it wasn't so weird. And, uh, and then with Angus, um, he was, he was uh, eight, no, he was 10 when Owen died. 
and he was maybe uh, 12 or 13 when he read the book. And he felt, um, he, he struggled with my portrayal of him and his grief at the end. And uh, it, it, I hadn't really thought about that, about how he would feel about being put into the book. So it was a bit of a, um, a blind spot or an oversight of mine to have prepared Angus better in some way. Um, and it, it didn't last long. He, you know, he, I, I think um, he was like, what is, what is this thing about me weeping? Why did you say I was weeping? And, you know, of course, some, you know, a 12 year old boy doesn't want to be portrayed that way in his, in oh. his mom's book. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I don't know what that would have changed for me. But it, it anyway, it, it reveals that I, you know, one of the hardest parts for me was trying to find that balance. And, and I was maybe overly successful in some ways. And then you know, had a, had a couple of missteps <laughs> with, yeah. with that part. Well, I, I had, I had a couple more questions. Um, there, um, I, I was really wondering about how Angus is now with the passage of time and how having Owen for his brother influenced any possible trajectories that he has chosen. Um, how how he is now you know mm-hmm. um yeah so angus is now 19 mm-hmm. and he's off at college he's doing a um a program that it's not quite it's not quite there yet but he's it's a it's a one-year transition program to, to so he can then apply to become a paramedic mm-hmm. so that's um that's his path right now and he's very passionate about it very excited we um you know it's interesting we don't talk a lot about Owen. Um, It's more in passing or if there's a a fond memory or if something reminds him of Owen, he doesn't shy away from from us talking about it, but he doesn't, he doesn't reminisce or delve into grief in any way. I think um, not like not with me, like he doesn't verbalize it. And, uh, you know, one of the challenges when Owen died, he was in a circle of friends who um, who knew Owen. I mean, our family was known to his classmates and to the school and we were just part of the community. So when Owen died, people, you know, understood that this was a significant, I mean, of course, I mean, a a sibling died, but they had a sense of what, you know, the magnitude of all of this kind of was or the context of what it was. But then about a year later, Angus changed schools. And uh, I think very few of his new friends ongoing, like from grade seven, eight, all the way through high school, I think very few of them even knew Owen existed. Um, so, you know, never mind that a brother died, but did a brother even live? You know, that that was, uh, un, it was reserved for very, very close friends. Um, and I think very few of them really knew. Uh, and Angus and I had conversations about it too, where I had become friendly with some of his friends' parents because of school events and things like that. And we had a conversation where I just said, you know, I, it's, it's part of my truth that I had a son who died. And when people ask me, do I have other children? I, I don't, you know, there's moments where I just think, you know, where I don't care to talk about it. It's not the right time. I, sometimes I say, no, I don't, you know, cause you know, we're at a party and they're drunk and I'm like, I, what am I going to say? Right. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, when it's an earnest question and we're, I'm connecting with somebody else, I've, I've said to Angus, I, I'm not going to lie about it. And so I don't know how, how much you're protecting this information from your friends. I mean, I can certainly ask the other parent to keep it confidential, that, you'll, that he'll reveal it when he's ready. Um, but I'm not going to lie about it if I don't feel right about it. And so he was totally fine with that. There's no issue with that. He said, yeah, I totally get it. And, um, you know, he's never felt caught out with it. But, you know, when we talked about it a bit more uh, and I asked him what his, you know, what, what is it about Owen that makes you not share? Like, why don't you tell your friends? And he said, well, it's bad enough that he died. And then people say, so first of all, people feel really sorry for me. And I become the kid whose brother died. And then they want to know, how did he die? And then I say, well, 
he he had a lot of disabilities like we none of us know why he died and so i think in angus's mind he died because he was just so different and it's just part of all the wacky things that happened to owen um so then he describes the disability and then people go oh okay but then angus is like well but no <laughs> it's not oh okay like it's not that doesn't explain it and it doesn't make it somehow better and so then and then he becomes the kid who you know who had a brother who died who was really disabled and you know so then angus is now cast as this kid that he doesn't want an identity about so i think you know for for kids that he knew that knew owen he'd had nothing to explain people just saw and didn't care you know and it was fine um but for you know when you describe your child or describe your sibling uh it it just creates all this like imagination and then assumptions and so i guess what i'm saying is uh, just a part of the answer is that um as far as I know, I mean, Angus doesn't live here now and, you know, I don't see him every day. So, uh, but as far as I know, Angus does not, uh, doesn't process things out loud very much with his friends um, or with, with me. Jennifer, can I, um, so just curious, um, this probably applies to Mariah too, just both of you as moms with children with and without disabilities and, you know, the frequent um, sort of setting aside of their concerns, their lives um, as a, having a sibling with a disability. And then layer onto that, that he's a boy. It doesn't, isn't, a lot of us aren't quick to process out loud what we're feeling because we just try not to feel it at all. Um, and then it's interesting to me that he's training to be a paramedic. Um, from a mom's perspective, just curious what you may read into all of that, that um, first of all, that he didn't sort of process those feelings with you. And if there's any connection to what he experienced with his brother, that now he's training to be a paramedic. Uh, that's just all kind of curious to me. Maybe there's nothing there. Just wondering what your reflections are. Yeah. I. I haven't thought a lot about it. Um, and, and I actually attribute, I mean, that's so interesting. I, I attribute Angus's interest in becoming a paramedic to other aspects of his personality that, um, or not even, per, but you know, other, other aspects of himself and things he likes to do and his attitude towards things and his capacity for academic work versus more physical doing. And, you know, he responds very well to um, tasks or work where uh, it's, it's, um, it's literal, it's physical. Like he can, he's, he knows when he's done a good job, when he can physically do something and academic work was never his strength. And so, I always thought of this as just a very practical job, you know, career option. And, and the fact that it's uh, emergency medicine, of course, you know, where we would have, uh, you know, had all kinds of encounters with emergency medicine with Owen. Uh, I hadn't really thought about that. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's a blind spot for me, perhaps, yeah. but. How involved was, and you don't need to answer any of yeah. this, um, it's Angus's life, um, but how involved was he in Owen's care? In his care, not really at all, other no. than, um, other than, uh, you know, just his reflexes were very strong. So he, he would see that, you know, Owen was drooling and he would just, you know, clean it up or he, he knew it was dinner time. So, um, part of what was assembled was Owen's tubes and his formula and, you know, I would gesture and he'd bring it and, you know, it was just all part of our everyday routines. Um, some of that was related, you know, you would classify it as care. Um, other parts of it were just getting on with life and we got to get out the door and so we know what needs to be assembled and, um, you know, he knew how to hook up Owen's G-tube, he knew how to sign a little bit and, uh, you know, was very helpful um, with the with the management of all the stuff and with pushing pushing Owen's wheelchair or with uh, telling 
caregivers what to do or not to do. Um, but because they were so close in age, there was nothing physical he could do. He was little and, uh, and you know, he, there, it wasn't as though he was old enough to, you know, pick him up, transition him, give him a bath. Like none of that was really uh, what we would traditionally think of as care work was not uh, available. You know, it wasn't a thing he had to experience or what did experience. Um, but Owen was very much just a regular part of our lives. There was nothing special <clears throat> about Owen to Angus. They were, they were brothers. They, um, they roughhoused, they cuddled, they, you know, Angus truly, and I said this in the book, I think, but at the time Owen died, he truly, truly had not I exhibited any kind of self-consciousness about Owen. So there was this real um, acceptance and companionship. And uh, Owen was like a, almost like a security blanket. <laughs> you know, if, if Angus felt lost in an environment, he would just go right, right over to Owen's wheelchair and either put his hand on his lap or hold his hand or, you know, just be close to him in some way. They, he was like a real um, uh, piece, like a, a, a touchstone of stability for Angus. Um, so there wasn't really a, I wouldn't say that there was a, any sort of burden or um, responsibility that Angus felt. It was more a uh, companionship and um, a reliance, I guess, a kind of dependence on Owen's presence. So, you know, he, he grieved a lot when Owen died and I, I chose not to write about it in the book a lot, um, but he struggled. He struggled a lot with trying to make sense of of his death. And then also, you know, we had so many caregivers and so much routine around Owen's care. It's, it's amazing how much, uh, how much it had occupied our lives because the minute Owen died, like literally the minute Owen died, it all went away. We no longer had caregivers. We no longer had staff. We no longer had appointments, everything just the, the floor fell out from under our routines and it, and it really highlighted for both Angus and I, that, you know, with all of that stuff gone, it suddenly became very quiet in the house. <laughs> you know, there was nothing to do anymore. You know, we, uh, you know, his wheelchair was sitting in the house and it was like, well, what, what's it here for? Like nothing. Uh, you know, it was really, it was really challenging. It, it wasn't a phase of like, oh, Owen's away and then he's going to come back. It wasn't, it was just done everything. And, and in fact, the morning that Owen died, um, we had, uh, he died at Michael's, at his dad's apartment, mm. at his dad's condo. Mm. And Michael called me in the morning and uh, told me on the phone. And I was just, I was in such shock. I like, I threw up and I didn't, I couldn't speak. I couldn't think. And Karsten and I went down to the condo. Angus was there. And I realized as we, the coroner was there, the police were there because when a child dies, they have to sort of kick into motion all these things. And I realized, oh my God, Ashley's coming. Ashley's his was his caregiver for the day. Mm -hmm. And I thought she's gonna be here any minute. And I and I realized, oh my God, all the caregivers, all the people who love him and all the like not even love him, it was all the people like all the things that we were expected to show up for were suddenly going to end. And and it just felt so uh like I said, the bottom fell out, you know, the the it just got pulled out from under us and so I think for Angus in particular, that sudden, inf the whole infrastructure of what was propping up our lives in a way, or you know, carrying us forward, especially through my separation from Michael, because all of that carried through when we split up and I got my own apartment, but all the caregivers came with us and it was like, oh, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle just you know, comes, comes over with us. So when Owen died, I think this was even more of a disruption and more of a, a complete, um, yeah, a complete upheaval. Yeah, I'll just ask one more follow-up, then Mariah can get back to her questions. Yeah. Then you don't have to answer this either, but I'm just, it, so I think I heard you say, just during this conversation, and it's evident in your book, just that you were just uh, kind of, um, did what you needed to do, matter-of-factly, um, and, so if that's just your personality or if that's the way you always are, or if it was just with Owen, um, something that you sort of grew into, 
just because you needed to. And then for Angus as well now, I mean, paramedics, just imagine like so many medical personnel step into horrific situations in which they need to just detach their emotions and respond to the emergency crisis mm -hmm. that's before them. And um, so that's just an interesting, it's yeah. interesting to me to hear you talk about that, especially as, um, as a mom um, who's obviously feeling, you know, such deep connection to your child um, and yet needing to do these, all these measures just to provide care for him just as an ordinary part of your life and his life. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, yeah, not, not quite sure what the question is there, but it's just an observation. Yeah, that's okay. That's I can, right. I can comment. I can comment on that. Um, I think, you know, Angus and I have very similar <clears throat> traits, um, but I think the origins of them are perhaps, you know, some of it's overlapping, um, maybe genes. <laughs> um, but I, I think, you know, a lot of it is his learned behavior from observing me. And I don't know that it's such an easy fit all the time. You know, I, I perceive about it. So I know for myself how I've processed things. And, you know, I've had decades, not, not recently, but decades of therapy. And so me processing things and, um, you know, whether intellectually or emotionally or physically even, you know, all, you know, I've had a lot of outlets for working through some of my stuff which is not, you know, and, and I am fairly logical and detached and um, methodical about how I go about things, but that doesn't mean I don't have a rich emotional life <laughs> too. But I, I do see an Angus, um, you know, he's young and he's a guy and, you know, he's uh, maybe learned, you know, observed some of my behaviors, but he doesn't necessarily have the resources or the tools to have, have arrived at the same place that I'm at and, and feel stable in it. So, you know, I think his, his journey is unfolding. <laughs> he's, he's gonna, you know, when, when he's, when he's ready to pursue some of the answers to the questions he has, you know, I'm here to support him and, and it's, it's, uh, he's nowhere near, um, he doesn't have the answers for himself. Um, the way I feel like I'm kind of getting there. Hi. <laughs> That's Moxie. Yeah, yeah. Moxie, Moxie, hi. hi, Moxie. Moxie. Yeah, Jennifer. <laughs> hi. Um, and Terry, just to re uh, go back to one of the original comments, I guess you were making is that um, I think I have I've always been a I haven't always achieved highly, but I've I've wanted to be a high achiever. You know, so I'm a hard worker, and I. I roll up my sleeves, I focus on the task at hand, I rarely um, stumble when I, like I, when barriers come, I'm like, okay, so how do I go around this? How do I go over it? Okay, forget it, I'll go this way. You know, I can course correct very quickly and that's, that's been through my whole life. Um, having Owen uh, kicked that into higher gear and I would say that for the first two, three, four years, I mean, you could see it in my eyes, like the, the kind of, um, you know, that the hell bent on doing it, you know, do all the stuff. And, you know, I was, I was very uh, driven to figure out how do we fix this? How do we, how do we make ourselves like, how do I get our family back to where I imagined we were supposed to be? You know, okay, Owen's delayed. Owen had some health issues. Owen has, you know, how do we catch up? How do we do all these, you know, so I was like this crazy, uh, you know, rat on a wheel or whatever, um, trying to hustle. And uh, that caught up with me. I don't know if it if caught up with me is the right word, but there, there came a point where it started to feel like I'm really just like, banging my head against a wall here for for what and and I think it was partly I maybe didn't recount enough of this in the book it, it would be a nice um, additional essay but having met families with much older kids like a young adult um, kids with uh, with extreme disabilities the way Owen did that really helped me see like you could see how parents you know the ones that I socialized with who were young and who had 
newly diagnosed children or who are still in preschool, like that energy, you just feed off of each other and you're constantly like, okay, what do you do about G-tubes? Okay, what did you do about this? And all right, we're going to go to this, what therapy have you tried? And the energy is really high and you're sort of buzzing from just your own adrenaline all the time. And then you see sort of middle school kick in <laughs> or high school and like, wow, there's a real drop off in terms of that uh, zeal for doing things. And you're now more into this, um, you know, parents are a lot calmer, but also a lot more um, jaded, maybe disappointed in the system. They start to see that rather than get better, things are going to get harder because their, their child is now physically a lot bigger and the services are harder to obtain. And they're, you know, the, the kid's no longer cute and it's hard to find caregivers, you know, like it's this, ter like it's this whole calculation that you see unfolding. And so the more I met older parents, the more I started to see, you know, my frenetic energy right now is, it's just, it's just, not waste, but, you know, where is this going? And I, like, clearly Owen is not going to live an independent life. And so where do I spend my energy and what am I trying to work on? And do we keep trying to enunciate, <laughs> like for what, you know, and does it really matter whether he picks his own shirt? I, probably not, you know? And so I also started to see that parents um, were much more interested in things like, um, accessibility and and rights and their own journey as adult parents like where where are their supports and where are their future supports for their adult children going to come from and so this activist mindset becomes much more um becomes much more present and advocating in school i mean that was the other big thing for particularly high school so um it's it's possible that some of my uh, like putting the brakes on for a lot of that early effort came from some of that exposure to older families. Um, I, I don't know that I could have, if, if I hadn't seen, you know, cast myself in the future that way, I'm not sure that I would have come to some of the conclusions that I did early on. Well, you were a remarkable advocate and caregiver for Owen. That was obvious and just, I mean, I loved the part early in the book, I think, when it was you were in the hospital with him while he was still in the neo, the NICU or whatever, mm -hmm. that you start, re were removing tubes <laughs> yeah. that the doctors didn't want to remove just because it was your sense that, all right, these aren't doing what what they think they are. And yeah. Just in your own intuitive sense and acting and as his advocate. And then the kind of encountering fake, all the fake work in the world of disability, all this stuff, all these activities that, all right, what it, what really is the the outcome of this? It's a lot of outputs, a lot of activities, but what's really the long-term benefit of this? And is it worth both my energy and Owen's energy to go through and do all these things? Mm -hmm. um, and it was just, so from beginning to end, just I appreciated those aspects of the book as well. Um, Thank you. And, Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And, can, uh, can I ask Terry what what how did you come up across the book and and do you have a connection to some part of uh, disability or sp yeah, something? Yeah. Well, I discovered somehow discovered Mariah's blog within the last year. Um, so then saw that she had this lit club. So this is my first time on one of these, but just thought, oh, so she. Yeah, she had the book, the you know, the PDF on her blog. So that's how I read it and didn't know anything about it. But I also work, part of my job is uh, I work for our church denomination and to um, advocate for the full inclusion of people with disabilities in our churches. Ah, oh, perfect. Okay. And I live with a disability myself um, that I was born with, a physical disability. Um, right. So anyway, oh. I just have lots of connections with, people, parents uh, with mm -hmm. disabilities. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate yep. hearing yep. hearing about yep. that. And, Thanks. And it's, and it's nice that, uh, you know, we've got, an, we've got a nice small group here <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> for your first book club. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> I'll turn it back over to Mariah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Wow, that's, yeah. 
Oh, um, so I did have one, one last, uh, two, two more questions that I really wanted to ask. One was, um, if Jennifer, if you have any advice for, um, for parents and advice for healthcare, and the other one was about um, your new book. Are you are you done with it? Is it is it out or where 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 how how's that? Oh gosh, did I say I was working on another book? <laughs> oh boy. Okay. So um, advice. Um, no. <laughs> I honestly, I mean, part of the problem, Mariah, is that. Um, Oh gosh, what's the problem? I so so not only am I now ten years away from when Owen died, so the actual experience of me having been with a child with disabilities uh, is a long time ago for me right now, and I find that my memory of that experience is really colored by. First of all, the fact that I wrote the book, those are the stories I remember the most because those are the ones people ask me about. They're the ones that I, you know, typed out myself. Um, so my memory is really funny, you know, about what our full experiences were. And so trying to, trying to somehow make meaning of it to digest for somebody else feels really off as though I would just be making up stuff that anybody could make up, like, you know, live in the moment, be kind to yourself, like, I don't know what, <laughs> you know, these are all things that, you know, we intuitive, we, we know that is just, you know, the human experience, you know, live a little, you know, don't beat yourself up, whatever. So I, I you know, I really struggle to come up with good things to say, it would, it would honestly feel a bit uh, made up, you know, I would be making my best guess. Um, but the other thing is, not only is my memory funny, but you know, I've lived ten years now without without the uh, without the work that I was doing before of looking after Owen, and I guess my uh, I don't I don't know how I would do it differently now. I don't know what would you know if Owen landed in my lap or suddenly you know it was announced there was a mistake. He's still here, and I I had him again. I I don't I I, I struggle even to. You know, it's like I've been deconditioned. So I, I struggle to imagine that I could even step back into it the same way again. And and I would I would need to really dig deep to figure out how to move forward with my life. Mm -hmm. If say, you know, I'm gonna use a terrible example, but if Angus suddenly had a disability or if there was a, a tr you know, um, if I, 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 or if I became disabled, I mean, these are all new things from this moment on that I would need to refactor and reintegrate into my life. It's not as though I could suddenly access all those things I had done before and just pick up where I left off because it's, it's like, um, you know, I, I recently had a, had a health issue about a year ago and I, I lost, a, like I decided to just get fit. And so I've been working out a lot. I, um, I lost a ton of weight. I, I'm really focused on nutrition and all those things. And I think about how, you know, there were other times in my life when I worked out a lot, <laughs> but it's not like I could just like pick up again, you know? So when I say deconditioned, it's like, I, it's kind of, it's, it's, um, you know, my, my whole physical body has reconstituted and, and, some of that trauma in my own body has kind of, you know, I can now sleep without, without my arm as though Owen is still sleeping in it, you know, like it's, I, I don't even know what I'm saying, but it's that, um, I think you, oh yeah, we well, were talking about what advice would I give? And I, I just feel like I, I can't even really access fully what that experience is like anymore to give any kind of helpful or useful advice. But what I can say is that the things, you know, if when I if I put myself back and think hard about who I was then and what I thought I would care about later, because like, I, you know, there were times when I would, you know, part of my active thinking process when Owen was alive, I would make decisions and I would think to myself, how will this decision affect us 20 years from now, 10 years from now, five years from now? What it, you know, on what basis am I making certain decisions? So I would sort of project ahead. And so now that I am ahead <laughs> and I'm looking back, I don't care about any of that stuff. You know, some of the, some of the decisions around the medical stuff and the surgeries and, oh my God, this is such a big decision. And 
none of it mattered that, you know, the things that, you know, there's, there's maybe two or three things that just haunt me, haunt me all the time when I think back on my life with Owen. And it usually has to do with something very small where I, where Owen looked so vulnerable and so trusting and so terrified about what was about to happen. And I was unable, it's like one of these bad dreams. Like I, I just could not either bring myself or I wasn't capable of intervening in a way that would fix it all for him and his his fear so I'll give you a specific example when we were in the NICU at one point he was a young boy you know it was beyond the neo not NICU he was in the ICU um, and he had he wasn't peeing he needed a catheter in order to empty his bladder and of course it has to go through the penis and Owen oh my god he was so terrified and there was this young doctor who had never done it before and who was like who had laid out all the utensils and all the stuff and was like kind of shaking herself and she was like you know and Owen was he had to be kind of pinned down and I had to hold him and I was like are you just going to get on with this or what you know and she was like I just need a minute I just and anyway there was this horrible moment where I thought I should have shut this thing down I should have said go get a superior you can't do this I'm you know I should have thrown my body over top of him as I forget it but I was also like in my own mind thinking this has to be done. This has to be done now or else they're, you know, it's going to get worse. He's going to get an infection. Like I was trading off all these risks and, you know, I'm not really painting the picture as well as I'm feeling it. Like I know what I saw and it just was this horribly haunting moment for me where I felt like I'd failed, failed utterly in advocating and protecting him and, he was so physically vulnerable and he knew he, you know, he, he was terrified and I was not able to summon up enough something. You know, I, I can hear my own language describing it. Like, obviously I, you know, I did what I could, but it was the things that I think about now are, um, are not what I thought I would be worried about uh, at the time for later. And especially since, you know, he died young at 12 and I think a lot of those things I obsessed about um, never came to pass. So worrying about him at 20, at 30, at 40, I spent a lot of time worrying about that. And it turns out I, it didn't, it didn't come to be. So um, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, you can't, you can't assume anything. So you, you know, you focus on what you can, but I, you know, I, I spent a lot of energy thinking about things that uh, didn't end up mattering at all. Yeah. Oh, I feel like I'm on the edge of just completely crying. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I'm sure it's, um, you know, there's, there's parts of this where, you know, when I wrote the book, I thought, well, it's such a small audience for this. Like, I don't really meet a lot of people who have kids as disabled as Owen, you know, and, and often when I describe Owen, I say to people, think of like the most disabled person you've ever seen in your life, like in your mind, that's like Owen. So whatever details you're imagining, like that's it. And I think, you know, when I wrote the book, I thought I, you know, who's going to read it? Who's going to care? There's like a handful of us, like in the city, even, you know, who's, who, and then I, you know, when I would hear from people afterwards, it was really remarkable to me how much it touches on, like, there's this kind of universal anxiety about parenting, for sure, and about how we advocate for kids. And, you know, and, and it had, you know, I never thought of my, my experience with Owen as having anything to do with parents who had kids with autism or Down syndrome, or some of these more, you know, non- I mean, I don't want to say non-physical, but, you know, Owen's primary focus for me, like the, his main problem was yes. that I had to carry him everywhere. Yes. <laughs> and I would see families where that wasn't an issue. And I think, ah, they've got it easy. <laughs> 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 and then meanwhile, I heard later, of course, you know, families would be like, well, he stays where you put him. <laughs> you always know what, you know, he doesn't get into anything. That's so great. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, you know, we all, we all have some common ground in some ways, but um, I think, you know, my experience with Owen has taught me for sure that, you know, it's this level of disability or any, any difference, really, all it does is magnify a lot of the things we all commonly experience, but maybe don't articulate or we're not challenged to make, make as intense a decision or, you know, we're not 
uh, wearing it so loudly all the time, you know, but when there's something like a disability or a difference of some kind, it really just brings all that up to the surface. And so it makes perfect sense to me, Mariah, like even though our lives are, you know, they would have looked very different in how we execute our everyday lives, like with our kids, but it, uh, you know, there's a, it's, it's pretty, uni not universal, but you know what I mean? Like there's things to, to, to that I'm sure you resonate with, oh, yeah. Yeah. even though yeah. it's not literally the same. It's like, yeah, I think that listening to your gut piece is really, really powerful and so important. And I know for me with Moxie, that was the very first thing I started picking up on, like for, and just my experience and being her mom was, was wow. There's going to be a lot said to me that I don't want to pay attention to, you know, that I want to be more tuned in to, to my, my internal voice and what that's saying to me. Mm -hmm. I think we're running the night's 9.05 now, so we should <laughs> probably wrap up and get this up. Terry, did you have any other questions or comments or anything that you wanted to ask Jennifer? Oh, I'm not thinking of them right now. I'll probably think of them later after we're done. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we can, we can tap at you, right, Jennifer? Oh, for sure. For sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you so much for everything. Thanks for putting this together, Mariah. Um, and I'm totally cool with you posting this or whatever you want to do. And uh, if, um, I don't know, if there's follow-up or if you want to have another chat, just let me know. I'm happy to. Thank you. Yeah. Thank and thanks, Terry. Nice to meet you. Yeah, same yeah, here. Nice thanks very much. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to both of you. Okay. Thanks okay. so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, too. Bye-bye.